Rev. Dr. Paul Lee Tan is a pastor, seminary professor, and Bible prophecy speaker. He graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary with Master of Theology and Grace Theological Seminary with Doctor of Theology. He has been a pastor for over 50 years in both the Philippines and the United States. He is a founding pastor of our Grace Christian Church and served for 16 years and is now Senior Pastor Emeritus. Dr. Paul Lee Tan is also Senior Chaplain Emeritus of Grace Christian College. He has been a Bible prophecy speaker for some five decades, has spoken to over half a million people worldwide. He was also Director of Asian Studies at Dallas Theological Seminary. He has written several books on prophecy, which are used as textbooks and references. Now at the age of 82, he has retired, but still active in Christian ministries. I have the honor and the privilege to present to you, Rev. Dr. Paul Lee Tan. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Grace Christian College Special Seminars. Let me start with a story. Once there was a little boy who asked his teacher saying, teacher, the sky is so big, but I am so small. How can God notice me? The wise teacher replied, that depends on how big your God is. If you have a big God, then he can certainly notice, notice you. Our study today starts with God also called the Triune God or the Holy Trinity. We shall be studying the Holy Trinity for the following three sessions. Now the Trinity refers to our one true God in three persons. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is also God, but the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. It is a mystery, and our finite mind can, cannot comprehend infinity, and we can just only believe one God in three persons. Now, today, we shall start with the first, God the Father. God the Father is all-powerful, all-knowing and everywhere at once, same as God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Now in seminary, we must memorize a lot of theological terms. But to me, the most comforting and beautiful terms are these three words, omnipotence, omni omnipresence, and omniscience, all describing God. It means that God is all-powerful, God is everywhere present, and God is all-knowing. God is the greatest. He is the greatest of anyone, anything, anywhere. And yet, God is very personal and down-to-earth. God cares for his people like you and me. And when we fully realize this amazing relationship with God, between God and us. We can go through life with a lot of confidence. If you have a big God, dear friends, then God can really help you. Now let us turn to Psalms, the book of Psalms, chapter 139. Chapter 139. Now the first six verses of this wonderful Psalms tell us that God is omniscient, all-knowing. And from here, we can also know about God's omnipotence and omnipresence. So let's go into this passage and go through it one by one. Verse 1, O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. 
this very first verse really summarizes the, summarizes the entire chapter. God already knows all about me. Not knowing more about me as I grow up into the future, but from beginning to the end of myself and you. He knows everything of us. God not simply knows our name or see our persons, but he searched every molecule in our bodies, every action we're going to take or have taken, every thought in our minds. God knows more than I know myself. And then King David went on and gave us six examples of how God knows all about us. First, it's in verse 2. Thou knowest my downsitting and my uprising. You know, this is a very common thing for mankind to do, to sit down and to get up. Have you ever counted how many times a day you sat and you rose? Maybe you do exercise at a health club on the treadmill and the machine would count for you the number of steps you run. But you know, that's only when you exercise on that machine. 10 years ago, I had heart attack in Manila. And uh, all my life, I did not, don't have any heart trouble, only in my lungs. I have asthma since childhood. So I didn't have any heart doctor or or take any heart medicine. But one day, there are the parsonage of Grace Christian Church, Grace Village. I suddenly had a heart attack and was brought to the hospital. The doctor immediately said, you must have heart, open heart surgery, quadruple heart bypass, almost immediately. Praise God for answering prayer. I went through that ordeal and I, that was 10 years ago. And the doctor told me to exercise and, and other things. So I joined the health club. The first time in my life, I exercised every day. The doctor prescribed a treadmill and other equipment after rehab and that open heart surgery. Anyway, I started with uh, simple running. Simple running on the treadmill, then the, my trainer says, faster, faster, faster I go. Then my trainer pressed the incline button and the treadmill went up, up, up. It's like climbing a mountain to me. And then the trainer did something different. He pressed another button and switch the machine to decline. And the treadmill was going downhill, down, down, down. And I had to hold the handrails uh, to keep from falling because uh, without that handrails, I tended to really fall down. And when the trainer say, don't hold the handrails, just keep on running. Uh, at first I could not do it. Later, it became second nature to me. You know, although I forgot about whether I was running up or down, God was keeping a record all the time. Maybe I think God was especially busy every time I entered the health club. Dear friends in our life, every time we move, God knows it. God knows Every time we blink our eyes, we move our hands, we say even one word, or don't even say, but just think about that word. That's how much God cares for us. King David tells us in the Bible, God loves you more than you can ever know. Secondly, King David wrote in verse two saying, you perceive my thoughts from afar. Thou understandest my thoughts 
afar off. God knows what we are thinking at all times, even when we're dreaming at night. You know, the government cannot punish what we think. It can only judge our actions and words. The reason is human beings cannot accurately judge what another is thinking until it is acted out or said out loud. But God could. God knows it. The instant we think a thought, it's recorded in God's book. Even now, God knows what we are thinking. Perhaps we are thinking about our own dress or about the oven that we left uh, uh, on as we leave home or what to do tomorrow in our business. Therefore, don't think we are safe to think of any thoughts as long as it's not said or acted out. No, God knows our very thoughts. And oftentimes, those thoughts become words and deeds. King David in this verse said, you perceive my thoughts from far away. Thou understandest my thought. How far away is it? How far is heaven from earth? The Bible says God's throne is in the third heavens. So there are three heavens. The first heaven from earth is called the atmosphere. The atmosphere, that's the first heaven. The second heaven is space, outer space. That's the second heaven. God's throne is in the third heaven. It's even farther. It's farther than the last star in space. And from there, so far away, the very second we start thinking, God knows what we think. Dear brothers and sisters, friends, amidst your problems, and difficulties of life, let me ask you, how big is your God? If your God is as big as King David's God, then don't be afraid. God can help you today. Let's go on. The third thing King David mentioned is, thou compasses my path and my lying down. When I go on a journey and walk on my pathway, or when I'm just doing nothing and lying on my bed, God knows it all. You know, during Bible times, to go from one place to another was mainly to walk or on an animal. They did not fly, they could not fly. They did not learn, they had not invented the airplane yet. Today, we have various modes of transportation. But the meaning of this verse is still the same. To move from one place to another, to take a long journey, God knows it all. And even if you're lying down still, without any movement at all, God also knows. Well, talking about long journey, I think I have enough of them. I am uh, 82 this year. I started uh, preaching uh, on Bible prophecy when I was about over 30 years old, 50 years ago starting. But few years ago, I received a letter, especially from American Airlines in Dallas, Texas, saying, congratulations, congratulations. You are now a member of American Airlines Million Mile Club. You have completed flying in our airlines, one million mile. I could not believe it. I was surprised. Did I really fly one million miles? Just on American Airlines, AA, I called the airlines in Dallas and they told me it's true. I have special privileges now, but I don't hardly ever fly now at my age. And, but that was just only one airline in many, many years of Bible ministry, preaching, teaching. I use many other airlines around the world, almost around the world. 
actually, I don't really like to fly. I don't want to go that, that high. I like to drive a car. When was, I was growing up in the Philippines, and once I reached the legal edge of driving a car, I, I immediately wanted to get a driver's license in Manila. And a missionary taught me how to drive, Mr. Ralph Romain of the Grace Christian High School. And what happened is he would sit beside me, lesson number one, and he would sit beside me and told me, just drive as fast as you can. We would go out on the country road in on the suburbs of Manila at that time, about 1954, was it? Uh, and, or a little later. And he would say, just drive fast, as fast as you can. And when I say stop, you must stop right away, even though I go out the window. And I, I did what he said. I learned stopping before I learned starting. And that's, he was wise smart i still i still have that habit of stopping right away so that i could be confidently driving along and at that time i could fight against the jeepneys driving in manila and i would invent my own way uh, and so on and as you know traffic in manila is is not easy to drive i know these pictures are from manila but they are taken during the busiest time of the, of the day. Perhaps uh, it's e easier now with the pandemic going on. Anyway, when I was as younger, I would fought those trucks and buses and jeepneys. Then I went to the United States to, to study seminary. I tried to use the same method of Philippine style driving in the US. I got caught, of course, several times by the police. I even had to go to school, traffic school, and learn everything again. I got very, I, I was a very good driver, very, very careful. I drive very slow. Then when I came back to the Manila, Philippines, to pastor the Grace Christian Church in 1967, I was the slowest driver in Manila. And uh, I had to, to follow the the style, but first I did not. Again, again, for driving too slow, they were honking all uh, their horns, uh, the car horns around me. I could not defeat driving anymore. So I got very afraid to drive in Manila. And now in Manila, I was, I'm really afraid to drive, except uh, from, from, Grace Village, maybe out to Banawi only. Uh, and then once from Xiang in Dewey, uh, Xiao Boulevard, Xiang, and I was able to go to, to Trinoma. That's all. And, and I, I, I get, get up. It's too scary. King David said, whether I'm on a long journey or simply lying down, God knows it. And God cares for us. The third, the fourth thing about God's omnipotence and omniscience and omnipresence is you are acquainted with all my ways, says King David. Verse 3, the second part of verse 3, all my ways would mean all my peculiar habits and mannerisms. God knows it too. Have you ever watched people walking down the street or even school children going out of classes uh, or in and out of church or, or the mall, everyone is a little different, even twins. The, the faces they have, the way they walk, how they dress and other ways, God sees it all. God knows it all. I don't know about your habits, dear friends, but one day my daughter told me saying, Papa, when you write something on the paper, your mouth would move with your pen. I didn't know that. Some years ago in Dallas, Texas, I suddenly woke up from my bed. I had just returned from Manila 
and has some jet lag. The sky was still bright. I thought it was already Sunday morning and I, I have only one hour to go to get ready and go and to preach in a church. I rushed to get prepared, got on my coat and tie, took my Bible, and as I was hurrying out to go out, my wife called to me and said, what are you doing? Where are you going? In my rush, I forgot even to take my wife with me to church. Then she laughed at me and said, it is still Saturday evening. The sun went down later today. You know, I don't want people to laugh at me. But this time I laugh with my wife. We all enjoy my absent-mindedness. The reason is I may know, I may think I know a lot of things, but I really do not know a lot of things. Even the smallest AM or PM, the difference. Some people eat with their left hand, some with their right. God knows. Some wear eyeglasses, some don't. Some has false teeth. Some walk with a slanted right shoulder. Some people remember things longer than others, and so on. Some forget, like me, right away. Once, we took some, a group to the Holy Land, Israel. And I know that there is a, an item in the beauty shop called Dead Sea Mud. If you, did, if you put Dead Sea Mud on your head, face and let it dry, you'd feel like a new person. So in Amman, Jordan, before the trip started, the tour started, I went to a barber shop and asked for the Dead Sea mud treatment. And this is what happened. They put that mud all over my face. It's okay, my, life, my wife still loves me. And after a while, they, they blow it so that the mud is thick and tight, a little painful on the, my face. And then they started scraping off the mud. They, they put some ointment or something to get the mud off. I felt like I was born again. I felt really good. Then we took the tour all the way up and down Israel and came to the Dead Sea itself. And there we see Dead Sea mud all over the bodies of of some tourists there, <laughs> some tourists there. All kinds of mannerism, whatever lipstick you put on or, or powder or whatever, God knows it, God sees it, and God cares. Verse 4 says, King David says, For there is not a word in my mouth, in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, Thou knowest it all together. Do you know that you that the average person speaks about twenty-five thousand words a day? They have figured that out somehow, and they say that a woman would speak five thousand more words a day. That means every year, each of us is writing one hundred volumes of books just from those words. And each book is 500 pages long for an average book. Wow, you and myself, we have every day for a year, we are writing 100 books just from our words. And yet God knows every word that we say every day. Even the unsaid, unspoken words, that are still in our tongues, that very instant God knows it. Many years ago, while in the Philippines, one day I got a phone call from Taiwan. It was Elder Wu Yong, Wu Yong Zhang Lao, in Taipei, inviting me to preach in Taiwan for one week on Bible prophecy. That was my first time ever preaching going to be preaching in Taiwan. I, I did not know that 
they were preparing a big meeting, combined meetings of several churches with choirs, different choirs every night. It was going to be over 1,000 people attending a Taipei Wesleyan church. And I didn't know that I was to use Mandarin language. I thought I would use English as it's common in the Philippines and translate it into Mandarin there in Taiwan. When the time came for me to go up the pulpit to preach, I was waiting for my interpreter, but the MC told me to just come up. But I, I, I needed an interpreter. Finally, Elder Wu Yong beside me sitting down on the pew beside me told me, just go up and I will pray for you, he said. And I thought to myself, praying now is useless. God forgive me. But you know, that day, what can I do? I went up to the pulpit. God worked a miracle. Every word in my tongue given by God. In Mandarin, I was able for the first time in my life to preach in Mandarin. And as, at the end of the sermon, as I gave the altar call, inviting them to come forward to believe in Jesus or for rededication of their life or for full-time Christian service, many came forward and I was so surprised. What happened because of prayer? God did it. And not only that, every morning in Taipei for a week, was only for pastors and elders teaching on eschatology, teaching on eschatology and hermeneutics. Again, it was all by grace, all from prayer. Now in Taiwan, some pastors would meet me now and say that that night they gave their life to be a pastor after I preached that night. And then they would add a, a, a sentence say, by the way, your Mandarin seems better now. Better or not, God knows. I did not know what I said that night and every night for a week, but God knew and he answers prayers. Let's go on. Number six. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. These are tender words used for a mother holding her baby. Have you ever seen a proud parent embracing a baby, cooing sounds, saying cooing sounds, holding the baby for everyone to see? Oftentimes the baby is silent the only sound is from the parent, the proud parents, making baby sounds, playing with the baby, touching them, holding their hands. And when the sounds came out, it means nothing. And yet parents love it. One day, my daughter, Dr. Christine and I went to see a doctor in Texas for my, uh, for my dental needs. And as we visited the clinic, after the visit, we wanted to pay the, doc the dentist, the doctor. But he said, no, don't pay me. Just pray for me. Pray for us. Just pray for us. They said, for many years, we don't have children. We tried many medical tests, but there was no way we could have children many years now. So Christine and I prayed for them. The wife was uh, the receptionist. And you know what? The next year, they were so excited. They said, thank you for praying. We have twins from the Lord. And you know, 
this is how God treats us. Like a parent, cooing to their babies, holding, embracing them, so proud of them. Brothers and sisters, God is proud of you. As you live, love God and Christ because Christ loves you first. God's going to love you abundantly and will answer your prayer. Ten years ago again, after my heart surgery, quadruple heart bypass, uh, because uh, the doctors took veins from both my legs uh, to, 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 to insert into to the heart for bypass. So it, it compromised the lymphatic system in my legs. This lymphatic fluid could not, like how God created us, could not automatically return back uh, and circulate uh, from the extremities of the legs back to the, to the upper body portion, could not. So for the next many years, I had to undergo what they call uh, lymphatic treatment. The doctors in Dallas Baylor Hospital, in Manila Hospital all said, there's no cure, it's lifelong. We have not, we don't know how to, how to you just have to learn to maintain it. So every, every time I sit down for many years, if I sit down to prepare a message or to write something, sit down for two hours, I see my, my legs uh, swelling, swelling. You could see it uh, there, swelling. I could, I could not control it. And no doctor could cure it. And if I don't take care of it, they say, the doctors say, the final worst case is amputation. Has to be amputated. Well, how did I, we take care of the legs? One way is to what they call leg wraps. Uh, and my wife learned to do it for me, to wrap my legs. These are elastic, elastic bandages and that, would, that would force the flow of the lymphatic fluids through, through the legs back to the upper portion of the body. Another method is what they call a foot pump. You have to sit down and, and we plug it into an electrical outlet for about an hour, once a day. And that's, and it's so, it, it's so recognized that Medicare pays for it. It's a $5,000 US dollar machine, which Medicare, if certified by the hospital, would pay, pay for it. Oh, I could not control even my own body needs. But God knows many prayers went up to God many years. Last year, my wife and I came to the States from Manila temporarily before the, the, the pandemic. And even in the airplane coming to the States, I had to use uh, this machine, have my feet raised up and so on. But then I noticed that as we arrived in Dallas, that my feet was not swelling for one week now. And then for one month, I could not believe it. And yet I didn't want to tell anyone because I, I, I wanted to really see if it's, it's happening, a miracle or not. Now it's about 10 months since I arrived in Dallas. I have not used none of these methods on my legs. And it is a miracle, I know, from God, the Almighty, the great physician, the greatest physician. No doctors on earth could give me the cure. But we believe in miracles because we believe in God. And this is what God does to each of us, dear friends, who are believers in him. This verse says, you beset me behind and before, you laid thine hands upon me like a proud parent of a baby. If you feel unloved, lonely, if you don't even want to look at yourself in the mirror anymore, then look upwards to God, listen to him. He is making gentle, comforting sounds 
joyful songs over you. Let God embrace you like a beloved baby of his. One day, Jesus told a parable, a parable of great price. Matthew 13, verses 14, 45 to 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. The merchant is Jesus. The pearl is the soul. The soul of everyone is worth more than all the world. The ground is where Jesus came and died for us. When Jesus looked at the world today, he did not focus on the buildings, the cities, the property, the history, the number of people. He focused on the soul of everyone, inside everyone. Jesus is looking for souls to save. Why must Jesus give his life it's all for the soul because it's worth more than the universe. One soul is worth more than all the world, says the Bible. If God empty heaven and all the jewelries, the pearly gates, the streets of gold, and all the precious stones in heaven, that would not be enough to redeem mankind. If God killed all the angels in heaven to redeem, that would still not be sufficient to save mankind. It took the blood of the sinless Son of God, who came from heaven and died for the sins of the world. That's how much Jesus loves you and me. And verse 6, King David says, verse 6 says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain. I cannot fully comprehend it. David gives up. He throws up his hands. He surrenders. He cannot fully comprehend God's love. He cannot use up God's omniscience, God's omnipotence, God's care for him. But that's okay. You don't have to comprehend. You don't have to fully know what God is or how big God is. Just accept it. Accept God's love for you. In the Bible, there are two thousand there are two thousand six hundred times the word God is used in the Bible. But then there's another God, a uh, word for God in the Bible, and it's called Elohim in the original. Elohim is used many oh, I'm sorry. Uh, God or Elohim is used two thousand six hundred times. It's a generic word for just God. But there's another word that cannot be pronounced or spelled. That's why it's hard for me to say it out. It's called, it's used triple times, 6,828 times in the Bible. Y-H-W-H. That's another word for God. In seminary, we call this the tetragram tetragrammaton, the four-letter word. Four consonants. Sorry, we cannot pronounce it because it has no vowels, all consonants. But how did the Jews read the Old Testament Bible when this appears 6,000 times, this word? Well, when they came to this word in the Old Testament, they would read it as just Adonai, which means my Lord, my Lord. And the reason is in ancient times, the Jews dared not pronounce the name of God for fear they might take the name of the Lord in vain. And that is to say the word God and not really mean it. So after a thousand years, the original sound of that word was forgotten. But then during the Christian centuries, when they wrote the New Testament and the church was started after Christ came and was ascended, dead and ascended, Christians took the vowels of Adonai, A-O-A, -A, 
and inserted it into the tetragrammaton to produce the word Yehovah, Yehovah, which became Jehovah, Jehovah. Now, what's the difference? What's the meaning of all this? The meaning is so precious. God is not just any regular God generic name, Elohim. God is three times more precious. Yehovah, Yehovah, Yahweh. Now, where did this four letter word come from? It came from Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, and God said, and Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and they shall say to me, What is his name? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Jehovah hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever. Moses was asked by God to go and lead the people out of Israel. And God said, tell them, Jehovah has sent you. Now, from this word, we get two meanings. First, God wants to, to be a personal God to you and me, to his people. Not just a generic God like any other religion have their God. God wants to be a him, himself to be our personal God. Called Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. God loves his people and wants to dwell to his people personally. He is Yahweh, Jehovah. Secondly, this word seems like it's uh, incomplete. Incomplete. How could all consonants be a word. Maybe that's purposely done, incomplete, so that we could complete it. How? Are we weak? Let's complete it. God said, I am strong. Are we poor? God said, I am rich. Are we in trouble? God says, I'm your rock and protection. Are we nothing? God says, I am you're all and all. Finally, King David writes a prayer for God to search his heart in verse 23 of Psalms 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. Wow, this is a very brave prayer. There are four points to take note here. First, David calls on God to examine him. Search me, O oh God. He did not call on himself to examine himself. David did not just want to examine himself and then he himself is to decide how good or bad he is. No, he wanted God himself to examine him. He wants to ex submit himself to a better judge, God, to be truly honest and to open his heart to God. In heathen temples in India and other places, some worshippers purposely do not clean the eyes of their idols. They let spider webs close over those eyes, hoping that their gods will not see their sins. No use. God sees it all, whether we like it or not. There's no escaping from God. Better voluntarily open up to God. Hiding is no use. Second thing we notice is David wants God to test him. David says, try me and know my thoughts. Search me, God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. David says, you search and you try and you, and you test me and see how, will, how I act in my thoughts. Wow, that's even so braver to ask for. For God to give us trials and temptation and testing, circumstances to change, life's beating 
and storms. And then God see how I react to them, how I feel, what becomes of my heart and thoughts. You know, to really know a person, talk to him or her during or after his testings and tribulations, the real person will show. David wants God to look at his heart and thoughts, not just his outward words and deeds. It's really not what we say or do, really. It's what we think in the heart after the storms of life. That's the real me. And only God can see that. The third thing we note from this verse is, David did not pray for any wicked sin in him. He used the word wicked way in him. Some translations it says every wicked streak, any any streak of evil in him, of untruth in him. David wants God to go deeper than that, a more in-depth examination, not just whether he committed any major sin, outward sin, to be a sinner. You know, some people can do a lot of harm to God's kingdom just by doing nothing just by saying nothing, just by thinking in his heart. Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss at Gethsemane. Have we ever come to God, dear friends, at midnight, alone in our room, just myself and God, kneeling with tears in our face, saying, God, have mercy, on me a sinner. My attitude, my hidden motives, my causing others to stumble and suffer, my self-centeredness, greed and will, my pride, everything, wicked way that only you can know. Everyone think I'm very devoted and lots of, lots of good works, but that doesn't really count. What I want is, God, you judge me. Am I really working for myself or for God? And then David concluded with this statement, and lead me in the way everlasting. David is not after this present life only. The present life is only one and two zeros. The most is 100 years or even a little over, or even just three zeros, which is impossible, 1,000 year life. Eternal life everlasting is one plus an infinite number of zeros, forever and ever. That's what David is concerned about. Lead me in the way everlasting. Eternity is a long time. Let us serve Jesus with eternity in view. What is earthly rewards? Live our life with eternal, eternal values and rewards from God. That's even better. And how can we do that? When we constantly examine ourselves, knowing God is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, the God who already knows all of, us, all of us, all about us, God will make our lives, our Christian lives, worth living and have eternal values. So we bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, in the quietness of this moment, we acknowledge Thee as our almighty God and loving Savior. Like in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Bless each of us, Lord. You care, you love us. And even though we may not be able to protect ourselves or care for ourselves fully, you do. And we cling to thee. We want to believe in thee. And we come to thee. 
Lord, thank you for what thou will do for us, in us, and then through us to others in the days ahead. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. Have a good day.